Brother Dennis has been here with us a few times, and we're thankful that he's able to come back again today. And so if you'll just join me in praying for him before he brings the message, that we'd all be blessed and received and, and we through change. Amen. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for this man of God that you sent to us again this morning, Lord. I, I thank you, God, for the time that you have uh, spent with him. Lord, as he's prepared, God, that he's met you diligently, Lord, and studied your word and, and been sensitive to your Holy Spirit, Father, to know what message you would bring to this people on this day and this moment. Lord, I appreciate, God, the, the time that has to be devoted, Lord, to proper study, Father. Your word says to, to study to show ourselves approved, Lord, and there's a, a trust that comes, God, with the opportunity to stand behind the sacred desk, Lord. And I just pray for Brother Dennis this morning, Lord, that you would just move him aside, God, that he would be your anointed vessel in this moment, Lord, that everything that comes from him would be seen as coming from you, Lord, that we would have sensitive spirits to discern it and to receive it. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just take liberty in this place this morning. God, we love you. Father, we have shown up to spend time with you, God, and I trust in my heart that you came here before us, Lord, and you are simply waiting for us to join in with you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all you are doing here at Prospect, and I pray you bless my brother in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be in Mark today, uh, the Gospel of Mark, and I'll start early on around chapter 3 and stuff. Uh, you know, one of the best advices I ever heard for young ministers was, Make sure you use a lot of scripture when you're preaching. That way you'll always know at least something you said was from God. When she was praying and talking about, you know, preparing and all that kind of stuff, it reminded me when I was in college and, you know, a test would be coming up and someone would pray before the test and they'd say, bless us according to our studies. And I'm like, no, no. God, I want grace. I want mercy on this test. I, <laughs> bless me beyond what I studied, but. The, the last few weeks, there's been so many things that God's been, been putting on my heart in, in Sunday school where we were going, just uh, the Holy Spirit moving and opening so many things up. And so I, I have a definite goal uh, on where I want to go to here in Mark, but I also want to put it into context and just kind of look a little bit at Jesus. And this is going to be early in his ministry and people around them, the things that are happening and it can be really helpful sometimes just to look at individuals in the Word because, you know, they're real people, right, living real lives. And so there's a lot we can gain from looking at how they handle situations, uh, what's happening around them, the good, the bad, the ugly, which is also a movie, but that's something else. So in, in Mark, it's real early in, in his ministry. And again, I'm going to be starting around chapter 3 and... In chapter 2, we had some questioning about fasting. We had um, Jesus kind of, you know, he was then uh, baptized by John the Baptist, you know, tempted by the enemy. He's just starting in his ministry and, and what he has to do. And they're already questioning him about different things. This is where you have the disciples going through the grain field and they're kind of hungry, right? And on the side of the road, you know, the grain... They didn't have as many fences back then. We're, we're, we're a lot better at fences now. Right? Good fences make good neighbors. But anyway, so they're walking through, you know, and they get they take a little bit of the grain, you know, and they, they're going to eat it. And you know why they got in so much trouble for that? That was work. They were harvesting. How many of you know that's probably not what God was thinking about when he said don't work? Right? So someone that's walking in hungry and they... Yeah, but the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, well, religious people are really good at this. They take something from God and turn it into a bondage, turn it into something that's not ever what it was intended to be, right? Uh, my favorite one was at that time, because you couldn't work on the Sabbath, so you could not spit in the dirt on the Sabbath, right? Because if you spit in the dirt, obviously you're making clay, and that's work. Oh, yeah, you could spit on a rock, right? So when we see Jesus spit on the ground, and he makes clay, and he heals the guy's eyes on the Sabbath, you know what he thought about their rules? <laughs> of course, he's God of the Sabbath. 
And again, it was their rules, not God's. God's not up there going, you can't work on the Sabbath. Watch where you're spitting. You know, be careful about that grain. You need it a little bit. You know, just uh, turning what God has for like a liberty, for like a freedom, for like the whole idea of having a day of rest was for man. It wasn't so that man had some bondage. It was so that he had a freedom. Uh, but again, the religious people are so good at, at making bondages out of freedom, making uh, evil what is good, uh, turning their traditions and then uh, avoiding the weightier things of the law, like justice and uh, righteousness. So he goes into the synagogue in chapter 3 of Mark. Um, I have the New International Version. And there's a man there with a shriveled hand. And right there, uh, I'll just start there in verse 1. Another time he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And this is that religious spirit. This is that righteous in themselves kind of spirit. I know what's right, so now I can watch you carefully and find out what you do wrong. Um, it's a spirit that's in our country, right? There, there are individuals that want to catch you doing something wrong. And so they'll watch closely. Oh, they said the wrong word. They used the, the wrong pronoun. They did the, the, this was wrong in what they did. And so they're, they're watching really closely to find a way to accuse. And so here they are, and they're all set. You got a man with this withered hand. Uh, I remember I was in a, a passion play in uh, North Carolina and, uh, at Jim and Tammy Baker's place. It was called Heritage USA. I don't know if you remember Jim and Tammy back in the 80s. They had their Christian resort. I was working there, but I was in the play, and they had the guy with the shriveled hand, and, and he, he was a southern guy, and he kind of had an accent, and it's like, you know, Lord, I desire to play the guitar or something. You know, just the way he did it, we always kind of thought it was funny. But anyway, he got this man with the, with the shriveled hand, and they're looking for this way to accuse him. And so uh, Jesus knows this. He knows exactly what they're going to do. They're, they're wondering if he's going to heal him. And in verse 3, Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then, then Jesus asked him, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? And they remained silent. Now, if someone asked you, What's good to do on the Lord's day? To kill or to bring life? I think you guys would have an answer, right? <laughs> Big life, right? To do good, not evil. But these guys were so caught up in their religion, so caught up in their way, so caught up in their desire to stop him from changing things, stop him from disrupting things. You know, Jesus was disrupting things, not because he was a disruptor, but because they were not centered on God's word, they were not doing what was right, someone comes that's doing what's right, it disrupts them. Right? It shakes them. It makes them angry because now they have to admit that they're doing wrong. Think about it when he went, uh, and they're asking him, by what authority you do these things? And he said, well, what about the baptism of John? Was it from God or man? And they're like, uh, okay. Well, if we say it's from man, the people are going to stone us because they know God was a prophet. And if we, if we say from God, he's going to say, why didn't we follow him? Uh, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. You get, if you get so caught up in religion, so caught up in man's way of doing things, so caught up in your form, your doctrine, your ideas that are separate from God, when God comes, you can't confess the truth. You can't even confess the lie <laughs> when the crowd's around because the people knew who John was. Uh, the people knew even with Jesus. So many of the people knew who he was. When they confronted him, did they go to him when he was in the crowd? Did they come to him on the triumphal entry and say, okay, we're going to arrest you now? No, where did they go? They went in the dead of night. 
in the garden when he was there just with the twelve. We gotta do this in secret when we take him away. We gotta we gotta be quiet because the people, the people might know. And and that's that dangerous spirit, that religious spirit, that idea. And again, it's very strong in our country, it's strong all around us. The religion they buy into, the ideas they buy into may be different than what they were here, but it's that same spirit uh, that we're dealing with. And so they remained silent. He looked around them in anger. How about that? You know Jesus got angry? <laughs> you know the one time that he got really angry? Zeal for his house kind of consumed him. He took a cord. He's like driving these people out. You know why he was so mad at those people that were selling in that area that he drove them out? You know why? My house will be a house of prayer. That area was for the Gentiles. That was where the Gentiles could come and worship. They couldn't go up beyond that point. They couldn't get closer to God. You know, you had the Holy of Holies and you had the Holy Place and and you go out from there and you go to the courts. And, but this was way out. This was where the Gentiles were supposed to be worshiping God. And they decided, we don't have any other groups that are coming in. We don't have any Gentiles. This is only for the Jews. So it's okay if we use their space to do what we want to do. That's what made them so mad. It's supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, all people. You're supposed to be a light. Unto the Gentiles, every ethnic group, it doesn't matter the color of their skin, it doesn't matter where they came from, it doesn't matter their gender or their social standing, none of that matters. They should be here worshiping God in this place, but you push them out so that you can sell your goods. That's what made them so angry. And they go, like, what authority do you do those things? Well, the very word of God and the fact that it was created for that, not for this. Everybody had the authority to tell them that because it was God's word, it was God's place, it was established for the Gentiles to come and worship God. And they lost sight of it. Ooh. So Jesus gets angry here, rightfully so, amen, and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This is again early in his ministry. In a synagogue, in a place of worship, in a place of God, on a day set aside for God, a man that has a withered hand, he's not able to work like someone else. Uh, how many of you know being able to have your hands to work at that time is extremely important? We got a lot more accommodations these days, hopefully. Amen. But back then, not so much. And Jesus is like, you are looking for a way to accuse me. You're looking for a way to come against me because I'm going to heal this person on the Sabbath? What hard hearts. And, and they even prove it, don't they? As soon as he does it, they don't go, praise God, he's healing. Hey, my, my, my nephew Carl's got a, a club foot. Maybe he could heal that too. Or no, we got to kill him. Boy, can you imagine that kind of a spirit? Where when you see someone doing good, you want to attack them. Hmm. You know, maybe there is that spirit in this country, in this world today. There are people that want to do good, that are doing good, that will show the truth, and other people want to shut them down, they want to kill them, they want to silence them, they want to attack them, they want to rise up crowds and masses to go after them, not thinking of anything specific. So the crowds are following Jesus. Here we go, verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, a large crowd, so that those that were diseased uh, were pu pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders uh, not to tell who he was. And so here we have crowds. Now, sometimes because we've seen movies and plays and stuff about Jesus, we think of crowds and we don't look at them as that big. 
But at times he's feeding 4,000, 5,000. They're only counting the males at that time. Uh, so when you add the women and children, how many know there's always more women and children in these crowds? <laughs> there are men in anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, there's tens of thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people that crowd. There's, there's times in Scripture where it says there's so many people they were trampling on each other. So here's these hundreds, thousands of people crowding, small little groups saying, we got to kill him. <laughs> the other one saying, man, if we can just touch him, we're going to be healed. This guy, he's got a connection. Evil spirits are coming saying, you are the son of God. He's like, shut up. Stop telling people that. Knock it off. That's quite a scene, isn't it? That's, that's amazing. All these people are coming. All these things are happening. Jesus has the boat, you know, so he can go and, and preach to them from the boat where they can hear him. Uh, all these are happening. And then in verse 13, it says, Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted. After the crowds, after these things are happening, and this is something you see in Jesus' life often, where he'll retreat away from the crowd. Um, the one time when he fed the 5,000, after he did that, they wanted to force him to be king. I think if you could force somebody to be king, he's probably not going to be a good king. But <laughs> he was like, no. And then they tried to follow him around the lake, and then he's like, you know, eat my body, drink my blood. And that was a good way to weed it down. <laughs> there wasn't very many left after that. You start to share the truth. You start to share the reality. You start to bring in accountability. And the crowds don't get as big. But as long as the crowds can come and touch and get healed, as long as the crowds can come and they can get some free food, as long as, as, long as the crowds can come and they can see these cool things happening, whoa, look, there goes a demon, oh, here's all this miraculous stuff, they, they'll be entertained and they'll have fun and they'll do those things. But when you start to bring accountability, take up your cross and follow me. Well, the crowds aren't as big then. <laughs> You can even have a rich young ruler come and you tell him, sell all you have and come follow me. Man, he's not stupid. So anyway, he goes to the mountainside and he calls to him those he wanted. And they came to him and he appointed 12, designated them as apostles. And what I want you to see here is he called a group of them together. And I believe it was more than 12, but he called the group together. And then he said, okay, now these 12 are going to be my disciples. These are the 12 he's going to pour into. Uh, there are times when there's crowds all around, and he'll look at the 12 and he'll say something to them. And he'll talk to them, and he'll pour into them. Because he knows men's hearts. He knows most of the crowd, what they're going to do. As a matter of fact, after years of ministry, after death, burial, and resurrection, after appearing at one time to 500 people and then rising up into heaven where people saw him do it, and he says, wait in Jerusalem till you receive power. There's 120 in the upper room. Not a whole lot. But Jesus knew how to pour into those specific individuals, how to pour into those ones. And so here's this group that he has, and he has this 12 He's uh, going to make them or have them be his disciples, something that we're all called to do, right? Go and make disciples. Individuals in our lives that we can pour into, that we can help develop. The goal, obviously, is to be a disciple of Christ. But for some individuals, especially someone just coming to the Lord, they can learn from us. Well, how did you do that? How did you learn from Scripture? How do you study? How do you, how do you, where do you go to church? You know, whatever it is, as we make disciples in our lives. So he calls those 12, sets them aside, and then we have this fun encounter. Jesus, uh, verse 20, then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and the, his disciples were not even able to eat. Now how many of you know if the crowd's so big you can't eat, you got a problem? Right? <laughs> we got to eat. Oh, I've gone to a lot of churches, and when I, all churches I know we're good at eating. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, they can't even eat. So again, this crowd, this is huge crowds that are coming around. Uh, and when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, and they said, he is out of his mind. You catching who that is? His family? His mom? His brother and sisters? His brothers and sisters? Jesus? <laughs> You've lost it. <laughs> you're nuts, man. You're crazy. What are you doing? 
I think he's lost his mind. I think he's crazy. I mean, it wasn't too long ago. He was the carpenter. He was the good Jewish son. He was, you know, a good, good guy around the family. Now all of a sudden, I, what is he doing? There's something wrong with him. We need to go talk to him. We need to go straighten him out. We need to go figure out what's going on. This guy, he's lost his mind. Do you surrender your life to the Lord as an adult and people think you lost your mind? You may be on the right track. <laughs> right? Because it's a change. There's going to be a change in your life as you follow God. The people you used to hang out with, yeah, there may be quite a few of them you need to separate from. Right? The things you used to do, yeah, not so much. Think of like, uh, my sister, when her husband got the third DUI and was going through AA and all of a sudden she's like, oh, God's real, and <laughs> gave her heart to the Lord. And it's like all of a sudden they're not having parties at their house anymore. You know? All of a sudden they're not hanging out with the guys that are drinking and smoking pot and all these different things and go, oh, there's something wrong. Praise God, that can be a good sign for us. We're moving <laughs> in the right direction, Right? But here's the other thing that will happen, is we will have this new family. Oh, here, we'll do this. Uh, verse 31. Jesus' mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone to call him. A crowd is sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And he said, well, who is my mother and my brothers, he asked. And he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, here is my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. And so that's that other side of it. Because as we walk away from that old life now, we have a new family. Amen? Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, grandchildren, people in the kingdom of God that now we can have that association with. And and so you don't get too hard on Jesus for saying those things. Remember at the cross, he still loved his mother and said to her, with John, behold your son, son, behold your mother. He took care of her. <laughs> he wasn't going to abandon her. But he talked about how to follow him, you have to, in some translations will say, hate your mother and father, follow him. You have to love God more than anything else. Love God more than family, physical family. But again, when the disciples are like, hey, we left everything to follow you, and he's like, yeah, and you're going to receive back a hundredfold mothers, fathers, and brothers, and sisters. And for those of us that are mature, we need to be those fathers, and mothers, grandparents, to the other ones that are coming along. For those of us that are younger, we need to find those that are mature in the Lord, not just old, Right? Not just old pastors of wind, but those that are mature in the Lord that can mentor us and help us and train us and show us and tell us. Because here's what you're going to find out. They went through some things. It's easy to look at somebody and think, oh man, they got it all together. You know? Nothing faces him. You know? Oh, they never get frazzled about anything. That didn't happen overnight. <laughs> And there probably are still some things that frazzle, and there are still some things that they're dealing with. But praise God, they know the one to go to. They know the God of all comfort. And they've known in the past they've come to him for comfort, and he's given it, and they know how to go there and get that comfort. And they know how to have that unity, that connection, that, that bond in his body with the family of God to know that there are others that will help, that will love, that will train. Man, a, a brother and sister in the Lord, I know individuals that are committed to God, that I know that have been a part of my life, that if something happened, it wouldn't matter where they are, it wouldn't matter what they were doing, I could contact them and they would help in whatever they, they needed to. Because they're serving God. Because they love God. And the family of God is so much stronger than the physical family, the genetic family. Although that should be strong too, amen, and that's God's design and for a strong family, but we're just looking more on the spiritual side. Today. Jesus is talking to them in parables, and he's talking about the seeds, um, 
that he's going to sow. Um, and that's kind of where I want to get to. So I'm going to go down to chapter 4. Jesus begins to teach in a parable. The crowd's gathered there. It's so large that he got into the boat. This is uh, chapter 4, verse 1. He got into the boat and, and set, set it out on the lake so that, you know, people could hear him. He's going to go out. Kind of cool, too, because water can amplify your voices. He like God's amphitheater. <laughs> Praise God. That's cool. Anyway, so this is where he's going to go into talking about sowing. And, and I, I hope you're familiar with the, the verse that talks about the sower that goes out to sow the seed. And some fall on rocky ground, some fall on hard ground, some fall on, you know, good soil, some fall on soil that has weeds that grow up, uh, all these different things that it falls on. Uh, and he's sharing this parable. And then as he gets done with it, verse 10 of chapter 4, when he was alone, the twelve, and the others around him asked him the parable. And again, so this is the twelve that he's just picked. These are the disciples. And then the others. Remember, he had some others that he called, that he said, come around. So they're there. So there's a group here, and they're like, eh, not so sure about this parable. Uh, they they want to ask him about it. And so in verse 11, he said, he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing and never perceiving and ever hearing and never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand the parable? How then will you understand any parable? Uh, the farmer sows the word of God. And this is where he's going to go and break down the parable. First part is here. He says, you are these chosen ones. I got these 12 that I've called to be disciples. I got these other ones, you know, kind of pouring into you some too. It's for you to understand these things. It's for you to know what God's doing. It's for you to receive. But for the others with the parables, seeing, they will never see. Hearing, they will never hear. How many of you know there are a lot of true things? There are a lot of things that are obvious. There are a lot of things that are real, that are out there in the world, that there are people that just totally reject it. Totally reject truth. And I'm not just talking about the Bible. I'm just talking about facts, reality. Uh, they spin all kinds of different things. They, they've got their own reality that they live in. they got their own world and ideas and they got their own narration and they can tell you about events on certain days and they got this whole thing about what happened and you look at the facts and you go but none of that actually happened <laughs> well yeah it did no it didn't um that's those ones that are on the outside those ones that are with the enemy and of course god will give them over to a reprobate mind god will Turn people over to what they want. But praise God that we can know what God's doing. We can know what his spirit is doing. We can know what Jesus is doing in this time. You know, right now, in this time, today, and throughout the rest of time, I believe, the sun is shining bright. God is drawing near. The Holy Spirit is available. The power of God is here to heal and to save and to transform and to set the captive free. God is moving in a powerful way. The harvest is plentiful. Laborers are few. <laughs> I mean, we're in a time of victory and power. But you look out and you see so much darkness, you wonder where it is. Well, find the twelve. Find the group. As a matter of fact, within the twelve, there were three that Jesus would kind of call aside at times there was Peter James and John and when there's a mountain where he's transfigured and he's shining bright there was three that saw that Moses and Elijah talking with him wow that's pretty cool the closer we are to Jesus the better we are listening to him and hearing him and knowing what the Spirit's saying the brighter, the glory, the more we're going to see what's really happening. Can you imagine? Nobody else saw but those three, that transfiguration. 
There's coming a day when he's going to return and everybody's going to see and every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. Praise the Lord. So he's saying, you know, yeah, but it's for you that, that this parable is for. I'm going to go down to verse 21 because I'm actually not focusing on the parable as much as some of these other things that Jesus said. He said to them in verse 21, Do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear. He continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And I know that gets into some tricky concepts with God that people have a hard time understanding. But first off, and this is the focus is on hearing that I want to focus in on today, where he's talking about be careful what you hear because the measure that you have, that you use, that you walk in, that's what you're going to get back and you're going to get more. So when he is talking about hearing, it's more than just words, right? It's more than just our ears. As a matter of fact, when he's talking about hearing, he's talking about the transforming power of God, like, oh, our sister said this morning, sometimes it's hard to turn the station when the piano's not playing, right? The music helps. <laughs> Walking with God, I've often compared it to tuning in to different radio stations, right? And there's certain songs, certain beats that, you know, we might uh, tap our foot. There's certain ones that make people do all kinds of weird gyrations and stuff. We won't think about those. There's different kinds of songs. There's different kinds of beats. There's different kinds of music to dance to. And so hearing that word of God, walking in that word of God, walking to the beat of that different drummer is going to affect our lives, how we live, how we move. So it's not so much that we're dancing through life, but it affects our lives, how we move, what we're doing, what we're saying. Uh, another word that they would have for that in the New Testament would be our com communication uh, in life. So that hearing that he's talking about and what he's saying is, as you receive from God, as you know, you know the Holy Spirit showed you something. You know God was speaking to you about something. How many of you have had those times in your life where you knew God was talking to you? Right? When you have that and you receive it and it's changing you, you know what's going to happen? He's going to give you more. He's going to talk to you more. And you're going to learn to tune into him. You're going to learn to hear him. And you're going to see more of that transforming work. And here's what happens, right? It changes the atmosphere around us. My favorite picture is the, you know, the gunslinger that walks into the, the bar through the swinging doors in the old westerns, right? <laughs> And the piano stops, and everybody turns and looks. Something's changed. <laughs> That's us. As we're hearing, now we're walking in that word of God, we're walking in that transforming power, resonating with him, vibrating with him, seeing that very word transforming our lives. Now we can go into places and transform that atmosphere. How many of you have gone to places that are dark, that are heavy, uh, places where sometimes it's a town, sometimes it's a building, a business, a home, of family members that you may know, where you go in and it's just the spirit there is just, ugh, just dark, it's heavy. For us to be able to bring that light in, that word in, that victory of God in, that's the power that we are able to walk in. And so as we hear, as we receive, as we live those things, we're able to bring it to others. And I will hit one thing on the uh, seeds, too, because I think that's important for somebody here. Uh, chapter 4, verse 20. Again, the sower is sowing the word of God, right? In verse 20, others, like seed sown in good soil, hear the word, accept it, produce a crop, 30, 60, 
and even a hundred times what was sown. And that's the beauty of a seed, right? I, I love fruit, fruit of the Spirit. I love the fact that the Spirit talks about fruit of the Spirit because fruit has a seed within itself. And that's so awesome. You know, if you need a peach, you still plant a tree. You eat an apple, the seeds are in there. Although apple trees don't grow true, don't try doing it. But the fruit has a seed within itself. And so here he's saying, if you have good soil, you receive the word of God, you're going to produce fruit. Fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, self-control. I could use a little more of that one. Uh, you know, all, all these things that are in our lives. But the beauty with that fruit then, that good soil, that word of God that's in us and it's producing fruit, it's growing because we're living that word of God. Now we have something to give to someone else. And if you have fruit, you want to give it away. Right? I mean, who's, who gardens? Who's got a garden or a tree or something? Anybody here? You know anybody that has gardens that grows a lot of stuff? Do they end up giving you stuff? <laughs> right? <laughs> People that grow gardens love giving food away. They love giving fruit away. Because that's, that's the joy of it. I have an abundance I can share with someone else. So the fruit of the Spirit, now when we're getting love and joy and peace, we're getting these things in our life and we can share it with someone else. Now they have the fruit. They have the seed. It can grow and it can transform a nation. Praise God. I wish the church had been better at that over the years. Our country wouldn't really be where it is if it had been better at it. We had been better at it. But the one thing I want you to consider in talking about the different soil that the seeds fell on is that the soil is what made the difference. That life, that heart, is the heart ready to receive that word of God. Because we're at a time where we need a revival, a restoration, a change in our country and within the church, the believe. And I've always looked at this time, I've known this time was coming for years. But when I've looked at it, I had often talked about a grassroots revival or a grassroots movement. I often hear that. I've come to realize over the last few years, it's not grassroots, it's the soil that needs to change. There, there's places in our country where the soil... <laughs> I like one guy, I was at a meeting, he talked about how the soil is constipated. <laughs> because they've been throwing all this fertilizer on it, they've been throwing all these uh, man-made things on it to make things grow, pesticides, fertilizers, all these different things, and the soil is really not alive. I know my soil in my backyard is alive because I've been working on it for over a decade, building it up. When I came in, you know, there's still rocks and stuff there, but now I can go anywhere in the yard and move a rock and there are worms all over the place. I love seeing worms in my garden. Because I know it's alive. The nutrients are there. The microorganisms, you don't even know how many billions of organisms are in one hand full of dirt. That's life. That's how God designed it. And as you have that life, then you can plant seeds there and it'll bring forth life. So our hearts need to be tender to God. There's sometimes things we need to break up. Right? Hardnesses that can be there, uh, calluses, areas that we've rejected truth, that we've rejected places, things God wanted us to do. Uh, we need a softening of the soil. We, we need life to come in. Uh, and we need to help others with that. To be those individuals that can receive the Word of God. There may be some hindrances there. There may be some blocks there. There may be some huge lies of the enemy? Can you think, think about these uh, Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law? Jesus comes. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. Oh, he must be of the devil. What? How do you, how do you get that? You know, he's, he's feeding people. He's bringing joy. He's bringing peace. He's bringing victory. He's bringing life. People are changing. John the Baptist comes. Roman soldiers are coming to John the Baptist and he's telling them, be content with your pay, don't extort money. You know, I mean, the, the place is being changed in a really positive way and they're like, we need to stop this. Wow. Talk about having a blind eye. Talk about having a deaf ear. Talk about having the inability to accept truth and reach out. At least Nicodemus, 
had some inclination to say, no, 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 wait a minute, no, wait a minute. That can't be the devil. Only God can do this. He healed the blind man. You know, he's he healed death. He's cast out demons. Of course, he had to go at night, kind of sneak in, find out what's going on, but <laughs> at least God was bringing him and changing him and transforming him. And so, as, as I think about hearing and think about uh, Jesus saying, you know, we need to receive, we need to take in, we need to be transformed. Another word that I hear in the like from the Greek that is sometimes used inappropriately is where Jesus talks about keep my commandments, right? We've heard some of that. Keep my commandments. Uh, as a matter of fact, even the New International Version is translated as obey. Horrible translation of that word. That word keep in the Greek has to do with either guarding a prisoner, so you're guarding, you're protecting, you're making sure, or guarding a treasure. Something that you want to make sure stays where it's at. So when Jesus is saying, keep my commands or keep my word, he's saying, like Mary, she would treasure them in her heart. Remember? When she was young, when she'd hear these prophecies and stuff, she treasured them. She hid them in her heart. She's not hiding them so that other people don't see it. She's hiding it in her heart in that she doesn't want to lose it. She doesn't want it to go away. So as we hear that word of God, as we know what God is doing and what he's saying to us, and the beautiful thing is in a service, each and every one of us, the Holy Spirit can be speaking something totally different to everyone here. And praise God, it can even be outside of whatever I was talking about. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he could get beyond me because I could get in the way. Easy enough. But to speak to each and every one of us here, so if we take that, what the Holy Spirit saying to us, there'll be at least one main thing, probably a lot, but there'll be at least one main thing he's speaking to us, so now we take that and we're going to say, okay, I'm going to hide that in my heart. I'm going to turn that over. I'm going to meditate on that this week. Isn't that great? Start a Sunday, start the, start the week, first day of the week. Holy Spirit gives us something, now we can turn it over. And listen, the more we're fellowshipping together, and the more we're allowing the Holy Spirit's presence to do things, so like, you be in a Sunday school class downstairs, and the Holy Spirit's kind of pointing at this, kind of nudging this thing. Then you come up to the service up here. Oh, there's that thing again he was talking about. Oh, now I got some clarification of that. It's amazing how deep that word can go then as it grows loose, because the beauty then is that you're going to be producing that fruit, that love, that joy, that peace. And praise God that it's not your responsibility to make the fruit, right? It's not your responsibility to do that work. He gives the increase. We surrender to that word. We surrender to what he's showing us. We surrender to what he's doing in our lives. We surrender to that convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And as we do, he gives us more. As we do, we have more fruit. As we do, we can help more people. As we do, we start seeing our home changed. As we do, we start seeing our neighborhood changed. As we surrender to him and walk in his ways and follow his precepts and hide his word into our heart, we see our community changed. And as we do, and as others do, because they see it in our lives, they're like, I want to do that too. I want to surrender to God. It's okay. He's not going to leave us as orphans. He's not going to reject us. We can cry out for wisdom, and he doesn't find fault. He'll give it to us. I see it in someone else's life. As we do, others start to do it, and we can see the nation change. It's not about the votes. It's not about the laws. It's not about that. It's about each, every one of us as individuals being that ground that the seeds can cut, because the seeds are there. The Holy Spirit's working. God is moving and speaking, no doubt about it. And if you can't hear Him, if you don't see it, let's pray before you leave. <laughs> right? Let's pray that those hindrances, let's pray that, I mean, there are enemy attacks. There are spirits that will come after you. There are all kinds of things. There are all kinds of other stations that are wanting to broadcast all different kinds of things all around us. But as we have that word, hide that word, it becomes that solid rock. And you know why his word is a rock? Because 
heaven and earth are going to pass away. But his word will never pass away. His word will never return void. His word is sure and secure. And all we have to do is surrender to what he is showing us. And step by step, day by day, hour by hour, he is right there with us, in us, and around us, preparing everything for us. And we just walk in the light. And that can be scary if we're used to darkness. <laughs> walk in the light. Confess sins. Praise God. All right. I shared, I think, what I'm supposed to. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the word made flesh. I thank you, Jesus, for your life. And we can watch and look and just this brief little bit of your life and learn some things. I thank you, Jesus, that we can hear and see you as the Messiah, as the King, as the Lord, whereas the religious people and the different ones that wanted to reject saw you as something else, saw you as demon-possessed, all these different things. I thank you, God, that we know the truth. I thank you that as we walk in your truth, that we can see freedom and that you set us free. And Father, right now, I just pray for each one here that those words that you are speaking to each one, Holy Spirit, just stay with them. Bring the water, bring the light, bring the productivity as they walk forth from here. Let the fruit be multiplied in abundance. May there be so much fruit coming, even from this group here, that it absolutely is undeniably changing what is happening all around. And we desire that for our country, for the world. In Jesus' name, amen.